so Lord, we, uh, I think we meant that. I want to know you. And I will rejoice in the simple gospel. I will rejoice in, in you. That's a little freaky, Jesus. Like you're simple, but you take us on a journey through chaos, it seems. And so, Lord, I pray that as we go on this journey, you would remind us to keep looking at you, not at the wind and the waves and the sea beneath our feet, but you. Simply good news, our Lord Jesus. Help us to preach, we pray. Amen. I think there's uh, one book that has affected me more than any other book that I've ever read. It's filled with good and evil, light and dark, creation and desecration, hope and despair, fellowship, and the deepest, darkest isolation. I should say one book that's affected me and changed me more than any other book, and yet... I never told myself I had to read it. Uh, I never uh, thought I needed to change because of it. I just experienced this book in freedom. And of course, I'm talking about The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, now, you may have thought that I was talking about uh, the Bible, and to be fair, it has definitely affected me and changed me more than any other book, except that I haven't always experienced it in freedom. In other words, I didn't read it because I wanted uh, to read it, but because I was terrified not to read it. But in junior high, I read The Hobbit and uh, The Lord of the Rings. It's actually the first book I ever, grown-up book, I mean, of course, Cat in the Hat, that kind of stuff. First grown-up book I ever read cover to, to cover the Hobbit and the Lord. I didn't even really know what it was about, but I uh, read it because I had heard that it was good. And you know, not like church good, but like good. Like, Peter, you're really going to like this if, if, if you read it. Back in 1973, in the basement of the Cinderella City Mall, they called it Cinder Alley, the place was like just full of like blacklight Led Zeppelin posters, you know, and bongs and Lord of the Ring paraphernalia. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. That's how it begins. And uh, in 1973, 12 years old, I could identify. I felt uh, inconsequential, longing to be seen, and yet kind of terrified to be seen because it all felt unsafe. I could identify with, with hobbits. And then Gandalf showed up with talk about, uh, he showed up with 12 dwarfs, that's that's ironic. Twelve dwarves talk of adventure and a dragon and glory and I was in. And then seemingly by chance an encounter in the dark under the mountain. Deep down here by the dark water lived old Gollum, a small slimy creature. I don't know where he came from, wrote, wrote Tolkien, nor who or what he was. He was a Gollum. Riddles were all he could think of. Before he lost all his friends and was driven away alone into the dark under the mountains. He had a ring, a golden ring, a precious ring. He wanted it because it was a ring of power. And if you slipped that ring on your finger, you were invisible. Only in the full sunlight could you be seen, and then only by your shadow. And that would be shaky and faint. It tired him, it galled him, and still sometimes he put it on. When he could not bear to be parted from it any longer, or when he was very, very hungry, he might even venture into places where the torches were lit and made his eyes blink and smart, for he'd be safe. Oh yes, quite safe. No one would see him. No one would notice him till he had his fingers on their throat. Quite safe, yes. It won't see us, will it, my precious? No, he whispered to himself. Of course, as you know, 
um, Bilbo got the ring, he obtained the ring, and with the help of the ring, he got the treasure and conquered the dragon, or maybe the ring and the dragon conquered Bilbo, and then tried to conquer his nephew Frodo. W whatever the case, although I couldn't, you know, really quite make sense out of all of it, the Lord of the Rings felt like it was all uh, about me. Outside of the Bible, it's definitely the best or at least most enjoyable book that I've ever read. So here's my first uh, set from junior high of the Lord of the Rings. It's all beat up and worn out. Here's another one that I bought years later. It's all beat up and worn out. But now imagine if in the fall of 1973 at the mall, while mom and my sister Rachel were looking for shoes or something, Someone approached me holding this bundle of books and said, Hey, buddy, could I interest you in the best book that's ever been written? All the cool kids are reading it. You're going to love it. It's called The Lord of the Rings. And then imagine that I bought it and he said, Now, now, now before you read it, let me tell you what it's all about. Number one, there's this ring of power. And the point is that you want to get that ring and hang on to that ring because the ring is power. Number two is freedom. It's how you will get whatever it is that you want. And number three, it's safety because it's going to make you invisible, you know, like the invisible man. And number four is strength for it's how you can conquer all your enemies. They won't be able to see you. They won't be able to bother you. They won't be able to mess with you. They won't be able to even find you. And number five, it's life for life is the survival of the fittest. We all know that. That's just common sense. Number six, the ring of power is the life and the good. For in the end, only the strong survive, safe under the earth, hiding from the sun, while the, the rest of humanity burns forever under its unforgiving and eternal gaze. Well, that would be weird, but imagine that I said that, and I believed him. We see it might get rather confusing once I had actually started reading the book right? A few weeks ago, a very insightful friend made an observation that many others have made, sometimes in the very uh, same words. He said, you know, Peter, sometimes when you preach, I feel like I'm in a graduate level course, and yet I've missed the necessary prerequisites. <laughs> and on one level, that sounds really strange to me. Because for me, the gospel has never ever seemed so simple. I think it's all summed up in a name. Yahweh Yasha. Yahweh is salvation. God is salvation. Yahashua in Hebrew. Yeshua in Aramaic. Jesus in English. Simple, simple, simple gospel. Jesus. And yet on another level, it makes a bunch of sense to me because never before has preaching the gospel to Christians felt so incredibly complex. I shared the comment with some uh, dear friends at dinner a couple weeks ago, and uh, the husband, raised in the church, smart guy, he said to me, well, yeah, I get that. I get confused. And his wife, also smart, but not raised in the church, said, I don't. I always think it's simple. Now, I know I can preach too long. I can take too many rabbit trails, but I always preach from Scripture. So it seems like we may be confused by the Bible because before we started reading, someone said, before you read it, let me tell you what it means. In fact, don't even read it. Just keep it on, on the shelf and then come to our club and we'll sing some songs and we'll tackle one verse at a time and tell you what it means. It's really just common sense, and we're seeker-sensitive, so what are you seeking? You know, we'll use the knowledge that we find in the book to cook up whatever soup you happen to be making, whatever you desire. We'll make the Word of God work for you. Now, I'm sure that I've communicated 
something like that at times in the past. And I suppose that's why I felt led for, for years to preach expository sermons through books of the Bible that always seem to go too long because I don't want to preach common sense, which is nonsense. And do it in the name of Jesus, who is God's sense, his logos, his word, his reason. And yet I do think my friend had a wonderful point. Perhaps we need some prerequisites to undo other prerequisites that we've just believed and never questioned. Prerequisites, prerequisites, hard word to say, prerequisites that, that you shouldn't just believe now, but you should question and even wrestle with uh, in the dark at the edge of the promised land. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that he wouldn't give a fig for the simplicity that exists on this side of complexity. But he would give the world for the simplicity that exists on the other side of complexity. So what lies in between? What lies between a simple lie and a world of complexity and then a simple truth and freedom? I would suggest some wrestling with the word. At the base of a tree, in the middle of a garden, at the edge of this age and the age to come. Okay, so this is our last message from First and Second Peter, and then I'm going to share a hope for what I hope to do in the fall. This is Second Peter 3 now for like the third or fourth time, okay? But we're going to read all the way through chapter 3, uh, to the end, the last verse, which we haven't read yet, chapter 3, verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets. You know, he's talking about the Old Testament. That you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and say, he didn't say commandments, he said the commandment. Jesus is the Lord's commandment, literally his word, right? That's a commandment. Uh, he's the word of Yahweh. And Jesus referred to one commandment, and, and that's love. God is love. And in John twelve fifty, he said, I know that the Father's commandment is eternal life. And he also said, I am the life. So according to Peter, there's one commandment, who is the word, the love, and the life, not written on stone and placed in a coffin, like we talked about last week, but standing on the coffin, on the ark, in the Holy of Holies, in the inner sanctuary of the temple. Verse 2, the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Apostles. What is that? No one tries out for apostle. They're, they're chosen. And they're not chosen to be creative, to invent something to say, but to deliver a message that they did not write, and they're charged with delivering regardless of their own desires. Apostle means messenger, and in the gospel, you know, Jesus chose at least 12 of those guys, and in the book of Acts, he chose at least one of those guys that, that you know of as uh, St. Paul. The commandment through your apostles, writes Peter, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own desires. The word sinful that you see up there was added by the translator, and there are desires, you see, that, that aren't sinful. I feel them, but perhaps my own desires somehow always are. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, writes Paul, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. You know, I think my flesh desires the ring of power. Verse 4. They will say, where is the promise of his coming, parousia, his presence? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. 
For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth or land was formed of water and through water by the word, the logos of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was, or it was deluged with, with water and literally was lost. But by the same word, the same logos, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up, they're treasured up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly, literally the not worshiping. But do not overlook this one fact beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing that any be lost, but that all reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be found. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people, literally, from what tribe of people ought you to be? Now, we're modern people, but in case you didn't know, you can't just decide to change your tribe. That is your house, like the house of Judah or the house of Joshua. The only way to change your house is to be adopted by a father or married by, by a husband from another tribe. So it's not your choice. It's another's choice. But it will change all your choices. Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, of what type of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the parousia, the coming, the presence of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the elements will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, like a man at home in his house. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace and count the patience of our Lord as salvation just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks uh, in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. Last year we preached through the whole book of Romans. Did you find any of it hard to understand? Well scripture says uh, yeah, of course. It's not common sense. Verse 16, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Now that's kind of fascinating because scripture just referred to scripture. It referenced itself. Graphe is the word that's translated uh, scripture, and it means writings, but, but Peter just doesn't mean any old writings. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but back in those days before Office Max, it's not like there was just a whole lot of writing. And, and Peter is referring to a set of sacred writings that we now refer to as the Bible. And at the time of Second Peter, it appears that all 24 books of the Old Testament had been canonized, which means that they had been established in rabbinic Judaism as the authoritative witness to God. But Peter also referred to the letters of Paul as scripture, as if some of them were already in circulation and considered to be authoritative. Peter and Paul both refer to each other in their letters and request the letters. I mean, Paul is quite bold about this. Like at the end of uh, 1 Thessalonians, he even puts them under a vow that they all read the letters and circulate the letters in public. According to the early church fathers like Tertullian, writing in 203 AD, both Peter and Paul died in Rome under Nero sometime around AD 66. According to Eusebius, the historian, writing in 325 AD, and quoting Dionysius, Bishop of Corinth from the second century, so this guy's from the 100s, Peter and Paul taught together in Corinth and in Rome, and in Rome they were martyred around the same time under Nero. Irenaeus, and get this, the guy's a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, so 
grandson of one of the disciples, writing about a hundred years after the death of Peter and Paul, referred to the four Gospels as authoritative and referenced to almost all the books of the New Testament. About 50 years later, Origen referenced all of the 27 books found in the New Testament today, and all those books appear to have been accepted by almost all Christians at the time, which was the middle of the third century. So that's around 250 AD. And you must remember that this was at a time when Christians were being fed to lions and burned at the stake. So when folks talk about some sort of powerful patriarchal institution deciding upon the New Testament, they're just not paying attention. And they're probably making videos that they want to sell, you know, that are all controversial. But once Constantine uh, converted to Christianity in 312 and began to call church councils, then the church met in public where they wouldn't, they're no longer fed to the lions, and they, they, they began to um, decide upon the canon. And their primary basis for that decision was apostolic authority. That is choosing those authors that were actually commissioned by Jesus to be witnesses. And so I hope you see that this is what Scripture, the New Testament and the Old Testament, are. They are the testimony of, of witnesses. So the Bible was written by at least 45 people in three different languages over a couple thousand years, a couple of thousand years ago, and delivered to billions of people over those thousands of years. So when I preach from Scripture, I'm not just giving you my opinion or even common sense. For at that time that each book of the Bible was written, that at the time they, they, were, they were demonstrably not common sense. Because a lot of those people that wrote it died for it. It was not common sense. But it was considered nonsense, and yet it has been proven to be God's sense, the written witness to his word. Recently, it's got a lot of bad press from liberals that think it's untrue. And I think it's gotten even worse press from conservatives who think it's a cookbook full of recipes for whatever we happen to be cooking at the moment. And it's even getting bad press from people who have come to believe what we believe, that God is love and love wins because they read it, judge it, and throw it out as unloving, even though it's scripture that testifies God is love and Love wins. So preaching from Scripture isn't the easiest way to draw a crowd at this juncture in history. And so I know that people wonder sometimes, Peter, why do you do it? Well, it's not because I think it's a magic cookbook for whatever soup we happen to be cooking. It's because I've found it to be the authoritative witness to the most amazing story. The story of God and Jesus, and me, and all things. And I think it's true. The objective historical evidence for its veracity is utterly unique and unprecedented relative to all other ancient manuscripts. And yet we are dealing, even though some go back to the very Dead Sea Scrolls that were lying there in a cave at the time of Jesus, even though, we're, even so, we're dealing with copies and translations. And you know this, that every time you hear a word, your brain has to ascribe meaning to that, that word. Human words are remarkably easy to twist. But stories, not so much. The story of a father and two sons a bridegroom and a bride, the harlot thrown at the feet of a, a holy man, or uh, the story of every man crucifying one man because they're jealous of that man. You see that that meaning, well, it kind of stays the same once you hear the story. So I find the Bible to be objectively true, but more importantly, subjectively true, for it, it finds a place in my soul. It's what theologians and philosophers call self-attesting. If, if someone says to you, Oh, the sunset is beautiful. There is no way to prove that objectively. And yet you testify that it's true as soon as you say, wow. 
I find it subjectively true and objectively true. And yet there are all sorts of places where I ask questions. And I have to say, <laughs> I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, one of those places, for instance, maybe the, the premier place for me is the flood. I was educated as a geologist. And all of the flood geology stuff, the little videos they put on YouTube, it just seems nuts to me. Worse than nuts, it feels sometimes like lies spoken in the name of truth. So maybe the flood story was meant to be a parable, like uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus said there was a, a man, but you, and, and in a way there was. So maybe that, maybe the flood was a local flood, since earth, Eretz, is more commonly translated land, as in land of Mesopotamia, which historically experienced all kinds of flood, and they're recorded in their ancient manuscripts, particularly one. But maybe, maybe it was a 40-day flood that covered Mount Everest to a depth of 27.5 feet, that's 18 cubits, which means the entire world would have been covered with five and a half miles of, of water. That is a whole lot of water that like suddenly appeared and then just disappeared. That's possible. I just can't explain it with science. I have to call it what it obviously is, a miracle. And then pay attention to what the story obviously means. I think it means something like this. We're all born of water and we will be born of the spirit. We're all baptized in water and we will be baptized in the fire. And so we all need an ark, not a coffin full of bones, but a boat full of life. So I find the Bible objectively true, subjectively true. And Jesus also seems to think it's pretty true. And, and this is kind of remarkable. He says it can't be broken. I think that's in John 10. And, and he refers to it over and over again. Even as if he had spoken it to others. And then he was speaking it through others like David. It's crazy. But more than that, time and time again, he has miraculously spoken it to me. And through people like my wife, who at the time didn't even know that what she said and heard was, was scripture. It always messes with my sign. I'm going, that was amazing, honey. You didn't even know that. And Jesus references the Bible as if it's all about him. Remember, he walked with the disciples on the road to Emmaus and opened their eyes so that they could see him throughout all the, throughout all the, all the scriptures. And he's done that for me saying, look, Peter, it's all about me. And oh yeah, I'm all about you. And then I find that I have often had to wrestle. And that's another reason I believe it's true. I often can't make sense of it. But when I wrestle it, it, or I should say he, begins to make sense of me. I've read a lot of religious books. And believe me, the Bible is not the sort of book that religious people would write if they were trying to start a religion. But I think it might be the sort of book that God would write if we were trying to create new people. The Bible's true, the Bible's full of stories, and the Bible itself is one, one utterly amazing story. These are my worn out copies of the Lord of the Rings, but believe me, you should see all my old Bibles in way worse shape. Now listen closely. Some of that is because I thought, oh, I should read the Bible, and I made myself read the Bible. But most of it is because I got sucked into the story. And you see, that's the way good stories work. You get lost in the story, and then you find the story in you. The, the Bible is exclusive in that it claims to be the truth, and yet it's profoundly inclusive because there's nowhere that the truth won't go. He's the light that enlightens all men. And it's the story that spans all of space and time and includes everything that's anything, even that which is not. 
You know, the Bible begins with the story of the seven days of creation. Day is yom in Hebrew. Peter just wrote, do not forget this one fact that one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. Even in Genesis 1, yom is clearly used to describe 12 hours at one point. And then it's used to describe what we think is 24 hours, it would appear. And then it's used to describe all six or seven days of creation. And then all the way through the Bible, we find these intense reminders of the seventh day. And what you are to do, which is what you are to not do on the seventh day, for it already happened, this thing, uh, uh, for God on the seventh God rested. Why? Because everything was good. And it was all finished. But before Jesus cries, it is finished on the tree in the garden, you know what he said? My father has been working until now. And I am working. So like we've talked about, Genesis 1 is an overview of all space and time beginning to end. And the rest of scripture is about the journey from beginning to end to end. And at a tree in the middle of the garden, God reveals the plot, beginning to end, and the way in between. In other words, it's all, the Bible is all one amazing story. So I'm trying to make these four simple points. Number one, the Bible is a story, and we modern people no longer believe in stories, unless we write them. But then we discover that those stories have no plot, no meaning, no reason, no logos. Particularly since the Enlightenment, modern people have told themselves, well, that there's no beginning. And there will be no end, and so there is no plot. And Christians have basically done just the same. We've said, well, maybe there's a beginning, but time will go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever without end, and we must write the story with the choices that we make in order to determine the end, you know, heaven or hell, because we, sorry, I'm yelling. <clears throat> I get it. We are the author. That's what we've said. Number one, the Bible's a story that we didn't write. Number two, the stories, stories store persons. They're a storehouse for persons. If, if you meet someone and you want to know a person, what do you say to them? You say, ah, tell me your story. And then you hope that they'll listen as you tell them your story. But if, if you meet someone and you want to use that someone, you ask for information. You want their resume. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you guys search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it's they that bear witness to me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Number one, the Bible's a story that we didn't write. Number two, stories store people. Number three, stories create people. When Scott Mamaday was a little boy, his father led him to the house of this old uh, squaw of the Kiowa tribe, and she just left him there. She sang him songs of the, quiet, of the Kiowa. She, she told him how they began in a hollow log in the Yellowstone River, how they migrated west. She told him of wars and blizzards and famines. She told him of great chiefs and buffalo hunts and then of the coming of the white man and deprivation and desperation and forced marches and finally Fort Sill, Oklahoma. She told him of despair and the determination of their tribe. And then Scott Mamaday writes, I left her house that day, a Kiowa. You know, you can tell a little boy to be courageous and to be good, and then try to describe those qualities to the little boy, and it probably won't affect him very much. Or you can just let him watch the adventures of Superman every day after school. The Bible's a story. Number two, stories store people. Number three, stories create people. Number four, the Bible is a story about God. Yahweh in Hebrew. He's the author of the story. God is the author of all things. So the Bible is an autobiography. John 1.18. No one has seen God, and this is a very literal translation. The only God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. 
So the, the Bible's a story about Jesus. Yahweh saves. Yeshua in Aramaic, the plot. Jesus is how God get, gets things done. Jesus is the, the word of God, the reason of God. Jesus is the logos, the plot. So the Bible's a story about God, Jesus, and the Bible's a story about you. Yahweh saves you, the beloved. You know, in every great story, uh, you, the reader, have to wrestle the plot. Have you ever thought about that? Gandalf battles the Balrog at the Bridge of Khazad-dûm, falls into the abyss, and we think, what? That can't be. It's the start of the book. But if you have faith in the author and his plot, you don't judge the book between the covers, the middle of the story. You surrender to the plot, read to the end because you trust the author and discover that this is how Gandalf the gray becomes Gandalf the white. That's gospel. The Bible is a story about you and how Yahweh saves you from yourself. The, the Lord of the Rings. In the Lord of the Rings, it turns out that the evil which everyone most needs to fear is, is not the evil Lord Sauron, but themselves. Why? Because each one of them lusts and covets the ring of power. So look at that tree. Uh, in all of space and time, has there ever been a greater power? He is literally the word and the will of God by whom and in whom all things are created, sustained, and hold together. He's the presence of the author and the plot. And at some point, long ago, when you did not know good from evil, you seized control of the plot and began to write your own story. You took the ring of power, but you didn't create yourself. You created a golem. Golem is Hebrew for unformed substance. It refers to a pile of dust that, you know, like moves around but does not breathe the spirit, the breath of God. In the Lord of the Rings, we discover that Gollum, based on the Hebrew word golem, was once just like Frodo. But now, carrying the ring of, of power, Frodo himself was turning himself into Gollum or into Gollum. In the Bible, we discover that each one of us have created a shadow self, a nothing that we think is a something, a golem, the old Adam, the false self, your resume, your ego. Hope you remember these uh, pictures from our sermon series in, in the past. The one on the left, the me that you think you have created is like golem. And the one on the right, the me that God has created is, well, it's like Frodo, but the real Frodo the Bible is a story, then, about God saving you from yourself with himself. Story of God saving you from yourself with himself. Upon the cross, Jesus descended into you and gave you the will to surrender the ring of power. It's called faith, hope, and love. In that way, Jesus is like Sam. Sam, remember who carried Frodo to the edge of the fires of Mount Doom, where both Frodo and Gollum fell into doom. Doom, which means judgment. They fell into judgment. Gollum was destroyed, and Frodo was saved from Gollum, his own false self, and so he was free to be what? His true self, free to be himself. And that was actually the end of the age. And so everything old, everything old became new. And it turns out that nothing is more powerful than the one who has the power to surrender all power. A humble fall, but filled with the judgment of God. A little child that speaks the name of Jesus. A naked dying man hanging on a tree. That is quite a story. So the Bible uh, is a story. 
The story of God saving you from yourself with himself and all things with him. And I think your heart recognizes the plot. It's profoundly simple. God is salvation. And you are his creation. But we all take the ring of power and convince ourselves that we are our own creation and salvation. And in this way, we write ourselves out of the story and into chaos, which is profoundly complex. But God is still salvation. For although we take his life, he has always given his life. And although we wrote ourselves out of the story, he constantly writes us back into his story, into history, the story of grace. Because God is relentless love. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The simple gospel is God is salvation. Jesus. The lie is me is salvation and we is salvation. Mises and wheezes. At the cross, Jesus destroys I am not, and he makes me who I am. And once you know the plot, the plot changes the meaning of every moment in the story and all your choices. Well, it's a great story. And I think we don't read it, and we don't hear it, and it doesn't change us. For before we started reading, someone whispered, it's all about saving yourself from God with knowledge that we're going to take from this tree. It's all about seizing the ring of power. And yet the life on the tree is all about what? Laying it down. And what's most terrifying about the lie is that it's often spoken by those that go by the name of Jesus, but refuse to surrender their story to his story, and so they are those that are whispering most convincingly, we don't really need to read the story. You just need to take like a verse for the day, and then we'll tell you what it means. So Peter writes of Paul's letters, which if you read them, you know they're like almost a constant quotation of the Old Testament. He writes to Paul's letter, 2 Peter 3, he writes this. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant, amethes, most literally translated unlearned. You know, Jesus said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your uh, soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So if you don't have much strength, well, love him with whatever strength you got. That's all your strength. And if you don't have much mind, well, just love them with the mind that, that you got. But to be unlearned is to choose ignorance because then it's easier to twist reality to fit your own desires, the desire to seize the ring of power. In modern America, we, we love power. And the church, of all things, is suffering, this is a fascinating thing to study, but from about 150 years of anti-intellectualism. Verse 16, there are some things in the letters, writes Peter, that are hard to understand, which the unlearned and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. And, And so I've thought about my friend's comment, you know, that listening to sermons of the sanctuary feels like a graduate course and and we haven't got the necessary prerequisites. And I thought in the fall, well, we could review some prerequisites. That is some foundational truths that undo some foundational lies that add up to the big lie that God is not salvation because we are salvation. So beginning in September, I do want to start preaching a series of, I think I'll be eight short, shorter sermons that, that won't exposit a whole bunch of, of text, but focus on foundational truths that over the years I keep seeing in the text, and we'll call it gospel, the new ancient foundations. Number one, hell, the elephant in the room. Number two, creation. Did God lose control of time? Number three, anthropology. What is an Adam? Who is the Adam? How does one make Adam? Number four, the fall, the doctrine of original ignorance. 
and the trouble with the tree. Number five, life and death, good and evil, new man, old man. Number six, the atonement, how God makes us one and he is one. Number seven, love and law, saved by free will, from free will, for free will. No wonder we're confused. Number eight, eschatology, God is salvation, Yeshua wins and has always won. So I hope you'd invite friends, skeptics, uh, family members, and, and I hope it will help you preach the gospel. And if it doesn't help you preach the gospel, it will help me preach the gospel because every time I preach, I feel like I have to review those eight things just so we get, get the story. And I'm going to put it on the website, and when someone says, I feel like I need some prerequisites, I'll say, well, here you go. Click this button and watch these. And then when we're done... I plan to go back to preaching expositional sermons uh, through Scripture. So we'd lose ourselves in the story, find the story living in us, and then lo and behold, that's when the author uses us to write the story in freedom. (laughs) So let's finish 2 Peter 3, verse 16, the unlearned and unstable Twist the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow. Grow in the grace and the knowledge. And remember, that's his knowledge of you, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. That's one way you can tell what story we're telling. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity Amen. Day of eternity, Hameron Ionos, is literally day of age. And in Peter's day, I think they all knew what age, what day he was talking about. It's what modern people once thought was impossible, but even physicists now argue that in some way must be true. And that is that space-time begins and ends in something greater than all of space and time. Eternity invaded space-time at the tree in the garden called the cross, but space and time have always, always been immersed in eternity, which is the age to come, when it is finished and everything is good and all is filled with the righteousness of God, who is love. Love is not the survival of the fittest. Love is the sacrifice of the fittest for all and in all such that all become a communion of love which is eternal life. In other words, we are all the manifestation of God's judgment. Peter just told us that we are waiting for the parousia of Jesus. And he just told us that we are waiting for the parousia of the day of God which is the day of eternity You see, I think he's saying that eternity has a shape, for lack of a better word, and that shape is Jesus. For in him, in him, it's a little word that shows up over and over again in the New Testament, in him all things hold together, wrote Paul. And so you see, we're all doomed to the judgment of God. Now, I'm sorry that my graphic skills aren't better, but hopefully you can see it, that all of space and time is held there, right there in the heart of Jesus. We're all doomed to the judgment of God. We're all doomed to a burning hot lake of grace which destroys I am not and reveals who I am. We're all doomed to be the soup that God is making. We're all doomed to become the image of God. We're all doomed to fulfill his commandment, eternal life. But you cannot enjoy it until you choose it, and so he gives to you his will. We're all doomed to be the absolute freedom of relentless love. Why? Well, because on the night that he was betrayed. The will of God, the word of God, the perfect image of the invisible God, the one who always chooses the good in freedom. He took the bread and he broke it. 
saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. And I'm reminding you, he said, do it in remembrance, like you're bringing all the parts together, of me. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So the sermon today has an application. You could read your Bible. But I'm daring you to remember what it is. You can read it as a cookbook for information that you apply to your life. And I've discovered that dad will sometimes let that work. When the kids are little, you let that work. But if at some time, some point, you say, yeah, but I want to know you. Oh, he'll, he'll answer that prayer. And that's when you need to remember that the Bible is a story. And you will lose yourself in the story and then find the story in you. As the author and the plot say, well, you did want to know me, right? And now I know you and you know me and we love each other. So I would encourage you to read your Bible as what it is. This utterly incredible story told through like at least three different languages from all these crazy bizarre people through this great span of time. And, and if you say to yourself, yeah, but it's hard because I don't have all the language skills, I don't, you know, and I don't know which translation to read, and I didn't get that interlinear that you suggested a while ago, and what about this, and what about that? I'm like going, yep, you, you might have to put some work into it, but this is what will help. It's all about Jesus, because that's what it says. That's what the New Testament said. And, and Jesus says, listen closely. I am the beginning. I am the end. And I am the way in between. And you know me. <laughs> you, you know who I am. So when you're getting, working through scripture, you know, and you're getting in the middle and things get kind of crazy. And you get to some part where you're like, oh, God, I, this is freaking me out. Say, Jesus, help me. And if you don't understand, if you're like, oh, I was a geologist, and I, you know, you can say, I don't know. That's what you do when you trust the author of a story. So I think God is saying to you, you didn't throw out the Lord of the Rings, Peter, because you trusted J.R. Tolkien. Could you trust me? Just keep reading. If you didn't understand that part, just keep, keep reading and trust me, the plot, and I'm right here with you, and I'll unpack things over time. And uh, by the way, it's, this, it's the story of me. You know me. And Peter, it's the story of you. And that means that as you walk through your life, you're, you're going to come to moments that are just going to scare the crap out of you. But trust me, I'm not only the author of the Bible, I'm the author of all space and time. In other words, all I'm saying is, believe the gospel, Jesus, in his name, amen. And uh, if you'd like prayer, you can grab me, Ted's on percussion today, so, but he'll be around in a, a little bit too or whatever, but hopefully you can stick around and say hi to some folks, even though it's uh, July 4th weekend. Those of us that are here, we got each other, so it's great to have you here, and uh, hopefully we'll see. I'm, I'm going to, we've, I'm going to be gone for a couple weeks. We're going to see our son, but we've got some great things lined up, so uh, have a great week. Believe the gospel. I don't know what else to say. Amen. Amen. Yeah, okay. Okay.